Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, at the second installment of Riverkeeper's um, new webinar series. Uh, in this one, uh, we will be talking about the rights of nature um, from anthropocentrism to ecocentrism. And uh, just wanna welcome all of you. Uh, my name is Katie Leung. I'm the volunteer and outreach coordinator at Riverkeeper. Um, and we have uh, three exciting guests for you today. Um, just before we go into the webinar itself, I just want to lay down just a few house rules. Uh, first of all, um, I think you should all be muted. Uh, if you do see an option to unmute yourselves, do not click that. Um, we would like all of you to stay muted uh, throughout the webinar. Um, we also ask all of you to hold your questions to the end. Uh, by all means, feel free to, uh, to put your questions in the chat. Um, or Q&A, and uh, we will be tracking those and answering them at the end of the presentation. Um, there's also a uh, an option for you to turn on closed captioning. So if you go into your, um, your lower panel, there's the three dots with more underneath, and then you should see captions and you should see the, uh, the options for um, having captions on. All right. So with that, I'll just give a uh, an overview, a quick overview of Riverkeeper for those of you who are new to Riverkeeper, um, and uh, and also just as a review for all of you who, who already know about us. So uh, just to start, uh, Riverkeeper um, is a uh, an environmental uh, nonprofit that protects and restores the Hudson River from source to sea and safeguards uh, drinking water supplies through advocacy rooted in community partnerships, science, and law. And there are a few methods on how we go about this, uh, including a uh, patrol boat, the litigation, water quality testing, habitat restoration, and policy and legislation. And in this particular webinar, uh, you will be learning more about a movement that Riverkeeper is diving deeper into, which is which is the rights of nature. Just to give a brief uh, background, um, rights of nature is focused on um, securing legal standing for uh, natural entities such as rivers, including the Hudson River, forests, and whole ecosystems in a way that provides a necessary counterbalance to the legal doctrine of corporate personhood. So I'll leave it at that and I will uh, definitely let the speakers to uh, explain more about that, to go much more in depth. So I'll get right into introducing the speakers. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Corinna Gore, um, who, is the, who is a member of the board of directors of Riverkeeper and the founding executive director of the Center for Earth Ethics. Uh, next, we have Thomas Lindsay, who is the senior legal counsel uh, for the Center for Democratic and uh, Environmental Rights. And last but not least, we have Stephen D. Owl Smith, who is a Riverkeeper Advisory Board member and a member of the Ramapo uh, Muncie Nation. So with that, I will turn things over to Corinna Gore. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you to everyone at Riverkeeper, where I have indeed been honored to serve on the board of directors for the past six years. I want to commend President and Hudson Riverkeeper Tracy Brown and Chairman of the Board Ernest Tollerson for their phenomenal leadership, including their support of this webinar series and this one in particular. So uh, thank you and thanks to everybody who is here uh, joining us this evening. So I want to start by showing an image, and it's of a gathering that was called by the Center for Earth Ethics uh, at Union Theological Seminary, which is where I work, in collaboration with the Ramapo Muncie Nation, Riverkeeper, and EcoPeace Middle East. The vision and intention that we held there was to honor the river as a life force, connected in a good way to other living rivers around the earth, including the River Jordan, and also to lift up the notion that we as human beings can be in right relationship with nature in a way that will inspire and guide us to make and care for peace with each other as well. So later in the program, you will hear from Owl. Um, he's actually in the, the this photograph on the lower um, right uh, corner. And 
I want to take this opportunity also just to give gratitude to the Lenape and to all the indigenous peoples and life ways of this beautiful bioregion that we live within. Now that so many of us are eager to learn from indigenous ways, we can't just pretend that it has always been that way. So on this occasion in particular, I personally just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the harm that's been done in that regard and apologize and just give respect. So I also want to say a word about the bigger picture of the global ecosystem, the biosphere that we are all a part of and depend on for life. We know that it is under tremendous strain, both from the pollution into the air and the atmosphere and the depletion of the landscapes and waterways on the ground. The last report from the International Panel on Climate Change states that, quote, there is a rapidly closing window to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. At a recent biodiversity summit, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, put it even more bluntly, quote, we are losing our suicidal war against nature. Our two century long experiment with burning fossil fuels, destroying forests, wilderness and oceans, basically also waters, and degrading the land has caused a biosphere catastrophe. In order to turn things around, we must look not only at the level of effects, but also at the level of cause, at what is driving this collective human behavior. Most of what is causing ecological destruction on this scale is perfectly legal and even socially encouraged. This crisis is about more than data, science, and technology, as important as they are. It is about perception and values. It is not the earth that needs fixing, it is us. So how did it come to pass that the environment is largely seen to be separate from human beings, a mere backdrop to our lives, or a set of resources for us to exploit endlessly without consequence? One insight from the field that I work in is that it has something to do with a bad interpretation of theology, which was most encapsulated in what is known as the doctrine of discovery. In the mid 15th century, there was a marriage between a certain interpretation of Christianity and the agenda of empire and colonization. This particularly has to do with the concept in the book of Genesis of dominion, that man is made in the image of God and is given dominion over the earth. So it was put forward in a way through this lens of empire to give some people the mandate to total domination over all of nature. And that included not only the landscapes and other species, but also those peoples who were intentionally dehumanized. Although this thought system I've described or mindset has roots in a theological interpretation, which to be clear is not the essence of Christianity. It has long since been secularized. The thing that is now held up as the highest good has changed from some notion of Christendom to a particular economic and development model that treats all nature and some people as resources to be dominated and exploited. So, for example, the measurement of GDP, which is the primary way we measure economic growth, is constantly lifted up as a social good, but does not count for striking things, pollution, depletion, inequity, or the long-term good of protecting and nurturing the commons, especially nature. And around the time of the founding of the United Nations in the 1940s, at the Bretton Woods Conference, it was essentially codified, despite objections from the economists who invented it. And remember that in 1948, the human population was 2.4 billion. Today, it's about 8 billion. And at the same time, there's been massive degradation of other species and ecosystems. In my lifetime alone, since the early 1970s, fully one half of wild animal populations have disappeared, largely because of habitat destruction in the name of economic growth. And there's also the matter of corporate personhood in a related way, this legal doctrine that's threaded through the Supreme Court decisions in Santa Clara Railroad in 1886 to Citizens United in 2010, 
enshrining and expanding corporate rights, which have often dominated communities, nature, and the common good. So we're getting the results of a value system, a faulty value system that we set up, and it's time to rethink it. And there is another way. There is a counterbalance that is substantial enough to make a difference, and it is a shift to ecocentrism. I want to emphasize that this is in no way an elitist call, because that is sometimes a charge that is made. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Those who are hurt most by ecological destruction are those who have done the least to cause it, the people living in poverty and marginalization, future generations, and all non-human life. And in this vein, I want to quote our legendary riverkeeper boat captain, John Lipscomb, who I worked, uh, who have worked with on these issues, who has worked on rights of nature issues, and he and I spoke this morning. And he has noted that the people who come to cool off in the river on a hot day or are coming to fish off a pier simply to put food on their tables are not the wealthy and privileged. The well-being of humans is linked to the well-being of ecosystems like rivers. And John and others within Riverkeeper have also voiced the need again and again and in many different ways for reciprocity with the river, not only because it would be best for humans, but because all life within it has an intrinsic, inherent worth and the right to thrive and flourish. So there are many aspects of this shift to ecocentrism. There is a shift in the thought system, the belief system. As one influential thinker behind the rights of nature movement, Thomas Berry, put it, the great work of our time is to recognize that the universe is quote, a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. There is also a movement to appoint voices for nature on corporate boards. There is a movement to add ecocide as a fifth international crime alongside genocide and, and others under the Rome statute of the International Criminal Court. And there's a movement for different educational models that will give perspective and immersion and voice to nature. But the fundamental piece of this movement, which we're going to hear more about in just a moment, is rights of nature as a matter of legal standing. And before I close my part, I want to mention one milestone for this in legal history was Justice William O. Douglas's dissent in Sierra Club versus Morton in 1972, in which he referenced a now well-known law review article by Christopher Stone entitled, Do Trees Have Standing? Justice Douglas invoked rivers in particular when he wrote in favor of the rights of nature. Quote, the river, for example, is the living symbol of all the life it sustains or nourishes. Fish, aquatic insects, water oozles, otter, fisher, deer, elk, beer, bear, and all other animals, including men who are dependent on it or who enjoy it for its sight, its sound, or its life. The river as plaintiff speaks for the ecological unit of life that is part of it, end quote. There are now a number of organizations that are working within this movement and communities and fledgling organizations yet to be. And I wanna just mention some of them that have touched our communities already. The Global Alliance for Rights of Nature or GARN, the Earth Law Center, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund or CELDEF, and of course, the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights, or CEDAR. There's also the Harmony of, with Nature program at the United Nations, which has good uh, resources. No one has been more central to this movement than our next speaker, who I first met when he was at CELDEF, and now, along with Mari Margul, has started and runs CEDAR, the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. I've learned so much from him. And this is his life's work. He brings experience as an environmental lawyer and his particular sharpness and clarity as a thought leader when he presents the background and current legal landscape. And also when he reminds us, as he often does, that rights of nature is, quote, not a spectator sport. So I'm very happy now to pass it off to Thomas Lindsay. Great. Thank you, Krenna. So we're going to dive right in with uh, a quick and hopefully painless uh, PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> and uh, so this is this is where we start, uh, the movement for the rights of nature. And we're going to start pretty basic today, uh, just about what is rights of nature, and then move to some more complex topics. So again, this is part of Riverkeeper's webinar series, our organization is the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. So we're going to start with 
rights of nature, what is it for people completely new to the concept? And it's the recognition by legislation or by court made law of the legally enforceable rights of nature as a whole or species and ecosystems. And most of us remember, maybe from high school and college, legal rights are basically the highest form of legal protection uh, obtainable in written law. So we, we talk about human rights and the US Constitution Bill of Rights uh, in our state bills of rights. Rights of nature is basically seen as an attempt to augment and strengthen existing environmental laws by heightening the types of protections afforded to nature. So moving from this regulatory protection status uh, that we currently have in the law, moving towards a rights-based status for nature. Uh, people ask, well, what, what are some of these legal rights? When we say rights for nature, rights of nature, and they include, and these have actually been passed in different places, right to exist, a right to thrive, regenerate, evolve, a right to be restored, a right to habitat, right to clean water, right to flow, a right to a healthy environment, uh, even a right to climate, which is now found in some of these rights of nature laws. The question is, why do we need rights of nature? And I think Karenna pretty much covered, covered why we need rights of nature. We need a different model of environmental protection. But uh, essentially, today's environmental laws treat nature as a commodity or as a thing without even the basic right to exist. And our environmental laws, even though we don't think about them in these terms sometimes, they actually permit environmental harm. They're all called permits for nothing, is what one of our environmental organizers used to say. That they actually, when permits are issued, they authorize the use and exploitation of the environment, the use of that thing for certain things like fracking uh, through aquifers or carbon dioxide pollution of the atmosphere. Uh, again, why do we need rights of nature? Uh, there, why are existing environmental laws that regulate the uses of nature inadequate? Well, it's because, again, law views the natural environment as property whose use is to be regulated by the law. And one thing we don't talk about that often is that once nature has been designated as property, U.S. constitutional protections kick in to protect property owners from having their property taken without just compensation under our system of law. So there are real constitutional protections that accrue to property owners by virtue of the fact that nature is treated as property under our system, which means that our environmental protection can only go so far before it becomes unconstitutional, which is always a strange thing to say, uh, but that's the situation we're in today in the US. These are some of the consequences of treating nature as a thing. Uh, Karenna covered some of these as well. Ecosystem collapse, our coral reefs disappearing by 2100, uh, one million species already extinct, uh, species extinction and climate change, uh, years ranking as the 10 warmest years on record, uh, and yet to see this summer. So uh, some mention was made to rights of nature having indigenous origins. Uh, we trace rights of nature work back to this indigenous understanding that nature is not property. So a much different understanding than Western European culture, that nature is not property, nature cannot be owned, and First Nations speak about nature as being a living being or as a relative. So just a quick comparison between the two cultural systems. We have uh, the indigenous system, which talks about nature being a living being. The Anishinaabe people uh, talk about the flying people, the swimming people, and the singing people. So birds and fish. The Yurok Nation talks about the Klamath River as being a living being or a relative. Contrast that to Western civilization, that nature is a dead thing. It's a resource whose exploitation is to be regulated. Uh, Sir Thomas Bacon, one, one of my favorite guys, and nobody thought we'd be talking about Sir Francis Bacon, I'm sure, but uh, he said once that the highest goal of Western civilization was to torture nature on a rack to extract her secrets. So I can't think of any bigger dysfunction than talking about the swimming people, the flying people, and the singing people, and contrasting that to Sir Francis Bacon about torturing nature on a medieval uh, torture instrument. Uh, so kind of the difference between how the two cultures see nature. When we talk about rights of nature laws, uh, municipal and tribal, so we're talking city, town, village, county, uh, as well as indigenous or tribal governments. As of today, over three dozen municipal and tribal governments across the United States have adopted uh, laws, local laws and tribal laws that recognize the legally enforceable rights of nature. And what's important to point out is that these are legally enforceable rights. These are not laws saying how great it would be if nature had rights. These are actually laws 
uh, recognizing that ecosystems and other parts of nature in those communities have legally enforceable rights. What are in these laws? Well, there are four basic things. One is a recognition of rights, which is the most important part, that nature is recognized as a living entity with certain legal rights. There's an enforcement provision, which generally gives people of the community the standing, legal standing, to step into the shoes of an ecosystem to bring a lawsuit on behalf of the ecosystem. There's a remedy, which means uh, that you must restore the ecosystem if you violated its rights or damaged it. You have to restore it back to its pre-damaged state. And also an implementation section where governments must actually guarantee and uphold these rights, which may include overhauling things like land use regulations uh, or other local laws that they have in place that violate those rights of nature as passed within the law in that municipality. We talked about tribal and First Nations. They're some of the leading voices in passing rights of nature laws. Uh, the Ho-Chunk, the White Earth Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota, the Ponca in Oklahoma, uh, Yurok, the Menominee, the Nez Perce in Idaho, uh, the Oneida, the Innu. These are some of the leading tribal voices for rights of nature that have adopted rights of nature laws and resolutions in the U.S. People may be most familiar with uh, rights of nature as passed uh, in the first instance at the national level in Ecuador in 2008. I'm showing my age at this point, but uh, I was asked to come into Ecuador to help write uh, those uh, provisions of the new constitution, so very familiar with them. Uh, these are the three articles that made it into the Ecuadorian constitution in 2008, uh, where the uh, delegates that were elected from across the country came together to write a new constitution. They had heard about a law that had passed in the United States uh, in a little place called Tamaqua Borough, just northwest of Philadelphia which was the first rights of nature law to be passed in the world, at least in a Western European context. So the most important parts of the Ecuadorian constitution are Article 71 and 72, uh, which uh, declare that nature has a right to exist, uh, maintain itself, regenerate its life cycles, structure functions, and evolutionary processes, and nature has a right to restoration. So this is language in the Ecuadorian constitution as of 2008. Uh, it's been enforced pretty aggressively since 2011 in a bunch of different cases. We're not going to spend too much time here, but the first case was in 2011. People always ask, you know, what's the practical effect of this? It's all well and good to have language and words on paper, but what's the practical effect? What you're looking at is a slide of some of the practical effects. So in 2011, the rights of nature provisions in Ecuador were used. Uh, to essentially shut down a local government that was dumping road debris into a river, thus changing its course. There was a shrimp farming case in 2015 to shut down shrimp farming in a mangrove ecosystem. Most people have probably heard about the Los Cedros case, which was uh, overturning mining permits in a cloud forest as a violation of the rights of the cloud forest. There's also the Estralita monkey case from 2022, uh, which dealt with rights of nature application to individual species. In this case, uh, an individual animal, uh, a monkey species that was deemed to have certain protections by the rights of nature provisions in Ecuador from the constitution. Uh, doctrinal developments, just a fancy way of saying conclusions from these cases, uh, courts have uniformly held, including the highest courts in Ecuador that look at constitutional issues. Nature is a subject of certain rights. People have standing to invoke those rights. Uh, to stand in the shoes of the ecosystem that has those rights. And there's been widespread applications in civil, criminal, administrative, and other areas of the law in Ecuador. From Ecuador, these laws have spread. Uh, there are now national and local laws and policies passed in a variety of different countries. At the national level, they include Ecuador, Bolivia, Uganda, New Zealand, Panama, and Spain. State and local laws have been passed in Brazil, Mexico, Canada, and the United States. People may have heard about the Canadian, uh, the Magpie River in Quebec, uh, obtaining rights in this first ever uh, coordination between a municipal government and an indigenous uh, community to come together to pass laws protecting the Magpie Rivers having rights. Uh, local policies have been passed in Northern Ireland, kind of a hot spot right now in terms of local governments uh, passing resolutions on rights of nature. Uh, people may have also heard that the country of Ireland is considering a constitutional amendment uh, and placing a constitutional amendment on the ballot for a popular vote, which would recognize uh, rights of nature in the country of Ireland. Uh, and also policies have moved forward in England and in Australia, in Australia around uh, land use planning, specifically in rights of nature injected into that process. 
So we're talking about rivers tonight, uh, Hudson River, other rivers in New York as well, St. Lawrence. There have been several key court decisions around uh, rights of rivers around the globe. Uh, originally, these rights of nature laws were statutory only, so they were written on paper, passed into law. Starting in 2016, judges started uh, actually making judge-made law around rights of nature, uh, holding that rights of nature existed in individual countries. So in 2016 in Colombia, the Constitutional Court recognized the rights of the Atrato River in Colombia. In India, the one of the state high courts has recognized rights of the Ganges and other rivers in India. And in Bangladesh in 2019, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh recognized the rights of all rivers in Bangladesh. In the US, the situation has been slightly different, it's been slower to come to acceptance and adoption. Uh, but there are three key cases that have dealt with rights of rivers in the US. Uh, the first one is the Sauk Seattle tribe case versus Seattle, which is the newest one. This was a case in which the tribe brought a lawsuit in the name of salmon against the city of Seattle to force fish passage to be installed along the Skagit River dams, uh, which were built before fish passage was a thing. And the tribe contended that the lack of fish passage violated the salmon's right to spawn. And what's fascinating about this case is that Seattle came to the table and forged a settlement with the Soxhoatl tribe, uh, which now requires them to put fish passage in along the Skagit River Dam. So it was the first successful rights of nature case uh, in the U.S. that resulted in a successful settlement in which the city agreed to put fish passage in uh, for the tribe's dismissal of their rights of nature lawsuit. In 2020, Orange County, Florida uh, led the way as a county of 1.5 million people in Florida. Uh, by a vote of 89%, they voted to recognize the rights of the Econ La Cache and Orkiva rivers in Orange County, uh, which was a popular vote on a charter amendment. Uh, so a local law that was put into their local constitution by a vote of 89%. Uh, folks that have worked on initiatives know that getting 52% is difficult enough. Getting 89% meant drawing from all kinds of political constituencies. And this uh, uh, ill-fated Colorado River case in 2017, one of the first to uh, posit that the US Constitution should be recognized as uh, recognizing the rights of nature on its own without a written law being in place. Uh, this was brought in the name of the Colorado River against the state of Colorado. Uh, basically contending that the compact that controls how much water is withdrawn from the Colorado River each year, uh, that the compact itself uh, needed to recognize rights of nature, basically the river itself at the table, along with the other parties who were withdrawing water. First enforcement case in tribal court was brought back in 2021. Fascinating case. We don't have time to go too much in length today, but it was brought on behalf of wild rice. Uh, the Ojibwe uh, Chippewa uh, tribe in Minnesota, the White Earth Band of the Chippewa, uh, passed a law recognizing wild rice, monomen in uh, tribal language, uh, about having rights. And this was a lawsuit brought against Enbridge Corporation for their Line 3 pipeline project, contending that Enbridge's withdrawal of water in huge amounts to put the pipeline in violated the rights of nature, basically the habitat for wild rice uh, to exist and flourish. Fascinating case, first enforcement case brought in tribal court was the Monoman case. So the question that we're asking today, uh, just to finish off these last couple slides, is uh, what if the Hudson River had rights? What if the St. Lawrence River uh, had rights? What would that look like? The first question is usually, well, where could we pass something like that? And it could be passed by any local government or indigenous community as lawmaking powder that uh, borders the Hudson River or is within the Hudson River watershed. Uh, so any government that touches on the Hudson River or St. Lawrence River could pass one of these rights of nature laws. Uh, what rights could be recognized by the Hudson River? Well, the same rights have been recognized for rivers around the globe. Their right to flow, right to clean water, right to flourish, right to naturally recharge. Who can enforce the law? It could be brought in the name of any resident of the locality. Uh, in the name of the Hudson River, basically the standing concept of cases being brought in the name of the ecosystem itself. Uh, but just a couple questions as we head into the uh, rest of this webinar is what would that look like? <clears throat> and so uh, two end slides. Uh, we went through this pretty fast. The Riverkeeper folks have graciously 
uh, uh, agreed to cover or carry this uh, these slides. So circulate them to attendees. So if you miss something, you can go back and pick it up. We also have some materials on our webpage. Uh, we maintain an international rights of nature development sheet, uh, which was last updated a couple of weeks ago about everything that's happened in the rights of nature field since the very beginning back in 2006. We also uh, do national trainings for continuing legal education for lawyers. And the National Academy has agreed uh, to allow us to carry one of those trainings on our webpage for free. So people who want to go through the hour and a half training can do so. And then we have a template library of ordinances of state statutes uh, and national laws. And this is information about the Riverkeeper. Uh, for more info, uh, riverkeeper.org uh, and uh, other links. Uh, and again, this is part of the uh, webinar series for Riverkeeper. And just wanted to thank uh, Katie, Sean, and Lauren for making the technical end of all this possible. So with that, we will conclude. And back to Karenna or Katie. Hi, the org. Yeah, Corinna or Owl, do you have any uh, lasting uh, words? Owl, uh, I think it's Owl's turn, yes. Mean juicing in Cocos Ramapo, Nawalatuman Wundak, Ato Ramapo, Munsi, Wunape, Anishinaabeg, Anishik Hwachi Manitou, Anishik. Kishalamokwing, Elamiliang, Gagana Ki Walk, Mbi Walk, Kashong Walk, Tindao, Anashik, 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 Anashik. I introduce myself in the, the Munsi language uh, by my name, Al, and my clan, which is Deer Clan, uh, roughly corresponding to the village of Hilburn in New York in the Ramapo Mountains, and of which we have three main clans, the Deer Clan, uh, the Wolf Clan, and the Turtle Clan of the Muncie, of the uh, Ramapo Nation. And we are, uh, one of our lineages, our principal lineage in this area is of the Muncie people. And of the Muncie people, we are also related to the larger Lenape family of people here in this region. Uh, who are also part of the larger family of nations, Anishinaabe family of nations, reaching up into New England and now into the principally into the uh, upper Midwest and into Canada. So his introduction showing you know our relationship uh, to each other in this in this in, in this human world. And then I began with a, a prayer in Muncie. Uh, our word for uh, creator is ki shelamokwang, and that is uh, who created us from thought. And a recognition that our thoughts are very powerful, and, and really anything that we see manifested in this world really began with thought. You know, it could be the building that we're here in, uh, the transportation that we use to get here. And so it's a recognition that our thoughts are powerful. So I mean, it could even be the Constitution. I'm sure that around the time that the Constitution, the United States Constitution came about, a lot of people, particularly in England, thought it was ridiculous. I'm sure many still do. But as uh, Thomas Lindsay uh, uh, mentioned, not only was the rights of nature, but even different forms of governance, that was how we governed ourselves in these in these lands in particular. I mean, there's over 500 federally recognized nations, over 60 state recognized nations. So it's not like we're a monolithic entity, but the type of governance, rights of nature, these types of relationships were you know, very common in particularly in this area of, of, uh, of the world. So uh, what was just a thought that eventually became the US constitution was, was our reality and has been our reality for since time immemorial. So Kisha Lamokwang, we give thanks to who created us from thought. Anishi Kawachi Manitou, or, or thank you, great spirit, is often translated as, uh, I actually prefer uh, physics translation, uh, great energy. When Einstein talks about E is equal to MC squared, he's talking about the 
equivalence of energy and matter, matter being a specific manifestation of energy. The concept of Manitou is that everything has Manitou, everything has spirit in that sense. Uh, the human beings, you know, the animals, and even the wind, rivers, uh, valleys, stones, trees, they all have, have spirit. And when you look at things in that perspective, then rights of nature naturally emerge from that kind of uh, mindset and orientation. Elamiliang, forgiving us. Gaganaki, our mother earth. Uh, MB, water. And I, I, I kind of think it's funny how in the Western mind, industrial mind, we tend to think, okay, we have environmentalists here, or we have uh, mining people here, and, and people say, I'm not an environmentalist. And I just kind of have to laugh because whether we like it or not, we are all environmentalists because we are all, not only do we have rights to water, I mean, we are water. We're literally water. You know, over 60% of our bodies are water. Some people would say that over 90% because every cell in our body is related to water. So sometimes I have to laugh when people say, we're not, I'm not an environmentalist because we all are. Uh, wind, air. I mean, we can survive for weeks without food, uh, days without water, but only minutes without air. You know, so I think the... Latin American author Eduardo Gaeno put it best when he said that there's a fundamental difference between the way indigenous people approach the environment and let's say the uh, industrial mindset of the environment. And I would include India and China in that now as well because of the way they're, the government policies they're pursuing with industrialization. I mean, they definitely have a rich tradition other than that, but it seems like amongst all the national governments, they're adapting this kind of view. Mm -hmm. But from the modern industrial point of view, whether it is to protect the environment or uh, mine the environment, and interestingly enough, there's a, a commonality there. The environment is seen as an object outside of ourselves. Indigenous people don't see that kind of separation. We see ourselves as indigenous people as reflected in the environment and the environment is reflected in us and the relationship between us and the environment. So there's not that kind of stark separation. And really that's also reflected in science as well. I mean, I, I hope people are setting down because uh, we all carry a body burden of over 200 industrial chemicals. Every baby born in the world today has that burden of these industrial chemicals. So rights of nature really is revolutionary in that it's it's beginning to, to look at the science and make decisions based on science, but looking at science from a holistic kind of kind of viewpoint. You know, we need to start taking the uh, straw off the camel's back in terms of these pollutants, or else we're going to have a breakdown. So rights of nature, we, uh, uh, Ramapo people, we passed a resolution supporting the rights of nature. And I'll just go over some of the brief uh, points of that. You know, we started with the prayer that, that I mentioned and then also talked about how we, the Ramapo Muncie Nation, are the mountains, rivers, and valleys as expressed as human beings. So we're, we're you know, realizing that relationship between us and, and nature. We, the Ramapo Muncie Nation, are the keepers of the past. That means we are the guardians, defenders of these lands. And I think that's something that all of us in this region, in particular, in every region we live in, need to to take up, we need to take up that mantle of, of, of being defenders of, of these, uh, these lands and waters. And our original indigenous name for the Hudson River is uh, Mohicanatuk, Mohicanatuk, which is the river that flows both ways. So I'm glad to hear that Corinna talked to John Lipscomb because I've had some really good conversations with John Lipscomb. Like, I didn't actually grow up in this area, but uh, you know, talking to the elders, talking to John Lipscomb, you know, it's really uh, deepened my uh, understanding of, of of the river. We used to, as a Ramapo people, we used to, as a community, come to the river during the summertime in particular. Unfortunately, in this modern era, because of uh, land use and, and denial of access to the rivers, you know, we have not been able to do that like we once did. Uh, but the Mahikana took the Hudson River is at sea level all the way up to Albany. So there really is tidal influences all the way there. 
And also even within the same area, because you have salt water coming up and fresh water coming down, it's actually would be considered a fjord, not necessarily even the typical estuary we think of. You know, because salt water is heavier than fresh water, you have movement in different directions at different rates, even within the same area. I'm speaking to you from Stony Point, which is really at the boundary between the fresh water and the uh, and the salt water. So these are important aspects of the river to 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 know and recognize because it really is integral to the health, safety, and welfare of the people here, and also the development of the nation. I mean, there's a reason why New York became a world city. With all due respect to Philadelphia and Boston, the way these other cities did not, because of the Erie Canal. I mean, once we were able to connect this region to the Great Lakes and Mississippi through the waterways, which are still highways, then you were able to connect Europe, Africa, and Asia to the interior of the continent. So the waters always have been and still are in so many ways uh, vital to who we are, our identity, and how we have uh, have emerged. So we, the Ramapo Muncie Nation, have never willfully signed any agreements or treaties, including the Treaty of Easton, giving up our rights to live on, use, and be with our lands and rivers and mountains, including the Mahikanatuk. That's an important uh, aspect to keep in mind when we talk about law, the development of law in, in different nations, because uh, the indigenous nations here, you know, despite, quite frankly, 200 plus years of genocide, are are we do have sovereign rights, and that is, you know, recognized in in international law. So the Mohicanatuk is the home of many beings, including other indigenous people living here now, the Ramapo people. Indigenous communities leaving guided by prophecy. You know, we have Anishinaabe people that are in many different areas now. Uh, new ones from Europe, many indigenous communities pressured to leave, including threat of death, that have new homes in other areas. And other peoples that arrived from all over this planet, referred to by some as Turtle Island, including from Africa, Asia, Europe, and, and this hemisphere. And the Ramapo River, Ramapo Muncie Nation recognizes that the Mohicanatuk is now the home of many people. And also many other beings, including mammals, birds, fish, insects, trees, plants, multicellular beings, single cellular life and stones. And we often, and you know, just leave out other forms of life. Um, you know, based on this uh, resolution, you know, we, uh, oppose the dumping of radioactive waste into the Hudson River. And it was interesting because uh, just a couple of legal terms. One is uh, reference man. I mean, our, our laws and what we consider to be safe amounts of, of uh, radioactive elements is based on studies done with a adult male figure it doesn't take into account that women have a different tolerance, particularly pregnant women. I mean, I was I would joke with my colleagues, it doesn't even say anything about eagles. I mean, what would ever happen to reference eagle? You know, eagles were killed off on the Hudson River. The eagles that are here now, again, John Lipskin brought that to my attention, and were actually coming from other areas, but unwittingly, and that's why we have to, you know, be careful of how we move. We unwittingly, with the DDT, ended up almost killing off all the eagles everywhere. But that's a hopeful story because eagles have come back. And our name for eagles, Wapalanao, because it flies so high and it's the one that flies to the sun. There's also another fish that is uh, emblematic of the uh, Hudson River, and that's Kapoksal, which is the Atlantic sturgeon, which is endangered. And you know, I'm still we're still working on, on that linguistically, but that fish is a very special fish in that it lives in both the ocean and in the rivers. So I'll close up with the uh, great law of peace. I mean, we have a great debt to the Haudenosaunee people, the people of the Longhouse. And they talk about the great law of peace. And I think that's something that we really need to, as, 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 a, as a planet, uh, really look at and understand because their story about how the great law of peace came about was not pretty. It emerged from a period of intense civil conflict, civil war between the different nations. Uh, 
And it was an inspiration for the uh, Constitution, the founders, or at the very least, they all interacted with each other. And the way I look at it is like a river. You know, you can't necessarily point to one place and say that's the only place that the river comes from. It has many different sources. This is one of them. So the, but in looking at the great law of peace and looking at the Constitution, there's several elements that were either left out or something that needs to be looked at in terms of the Constitution. One of those is the rights of women. I mean, how can we call ourselves a democracy when women didn't have the right to vote until 1920? And the second is uh, what we call rights of nature. That is incorporated in how the Haudenosaunee would, would uh, address council and open up many meetings. They would give thanks to all the beings in creation, which is uh, how I opened up here. So with that, I just wanted to give thanks to all the people that are on this uh, on this webinar from the the Muncie people, uh, you know, whose whose leader now is uh, Chief Chief Dwayne Perry, and just say that one way forward to help address you know the climate change, the hydro fracking, uh, nuclear power is to recognize the rights of the water. I mean, not only do we need to protect water, but realize that we're water protected. And one other thing about the the nuclear that I found interesting is that. It requires so much water that almost all nuclear power plants are located on water. And we need to be careful of that because of the climate change. But also just to protect us from the very radiation of these power plants, water is integral to that. So water protects us in so many ways. So it's important that we give thanks to water. So on that note, Anishik can be thank you, water. And thank you, River King, Anishik. Yeah, thank you so much, Owl. And, uh... Thank you to Corona and Thomas for such a powerful and, and, and insightful um, presentation. Um, if, uh, just so you know, uh, since this is being recorded, uh, this will be on our YouTube and um, this will be sent to all of you, everybody who has registered. And uh, I, I definitely highly recommend you to rewatch the, the recording for such powerful and insightful uh, messaging. So thank you to all three of you. Um, so if, uh, both Krenna and Thomas, if you have any, uh, lasting words, um, let's get to you two first before we move into, uh, move into, uh, some Q&A. Mm -hmm. Q&A is, is good to go for me. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, but first, let me just uh, pop in here um, into the chat, the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights, um, the website, so that all of you have it. And then um, I'll also pop in uh, the link for Riverkeeper in a little bit. But let's get into the uh, questions. Okay. Um, so the first question is... Um, so in your experience uh, with indigenous people and groups, uh, how can we encourage uh, everything, everywhere, all at once activism to help with the climate crisis uh, while honoring the trauma and appropriate time needed for working with tribal nations? Who would like to take that on? So I can I can take a shot and then Corinna now if you want to follow on. I th I think um, just speaking from a legal uh, lawyer's perspective, I think uh, we've kind of given up on Western courts to enforce rights of nature laws. I've worked over the past many years trying to get, for lack of a better word, white European judges to understand the importance of rights of nature. I think the next big shift is going to come in tribal courts. So. Uh, we've been appearing in tribal courts recently, but I think that's the next wave of the rights of nature thing. I, I also agree with the fact that very few people feel urgency. I, I don't understand it. It's kind of like the frog in the boiling water, I suppose. A lot of people think that we have time that we don't have. And you got to, and, and this makes the rights of nature work even more kind of timely, which is that we have to do stuff now, today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. We also can't keep writing letters to elected officials or regulatory officials begging them to do the right thing, that it's kind of time to see ourselves differently. Like 
we have up till now seen ourselves as kind of pressure politics people to pressure others to do stuff. We actually have to begin to see ourselves as law drafters, law makers, law enforcers. And I think that means changing our identity somewhat to move from reformer to kind of radicals uh, and move outside the system to do this work because there's no time left. We're, we're out of time. And the rights of nature laws offer that ability for anyone to do this where you live, at home. You can go to your local city uh, or county or village or town, present them with a rights of nature law and, and work to get it passed, or in those places with citizen initiative, override your elected officials, go out, collect petition signatures, like they're about ready to do in uh, Washington state in a couple cities and in uh, Massachusetts now around wetlands and rights of wetlands. This is not, this is not complicated. This is, uh, we, are, we are kind of over the cliff at this point from an environmental perspective. And there's an, uh, there's an emergency and a crisis. And I think the rights of nature can step into that crisis and be something that we need it to be, but we need to, we need to start, we need to move. I think, I think it's also about, about listening because uh, with indigenous people, we're, we're very rooted in, in uh, the, the places that we've emerged from. And just to kind of give you an example, in, in Ringwood, we've had tremendous amounts of toxic waste dumped in into you know one of our, our areas there. So, you know, we have a, a major dilemma because you know while some and all you know of our community will move to different areas, I mean that many people are living not only near the Superfund site, they live within the Superfund site area. So. It's, uh, I mean, it might not seem like a, a, a matter of urgency, but indigenous people have had a pretty uh, consistent message over the centuries since the contact with uh, with Europeans. And that is, you know, to really respect, you know, the not only the people of the land, but the land itself. And so I think that's where the sense of urgency comes from, is that, you know, we don't have that luxury of saying, oh, we'll just move somewhere else. I mean, with all due respect to uh, Mr. Elon Musk, we, we're not on Mars yet. You know, I think I'd like to stay here on Earth, but yeah, I mean, I think when you look at it from a different perspective, there's always been that sense of urgency, and it's just a matter of listening and and realizing that's been the message all along. Mm -hmm. So let's go into um, our next question. Um, so as the three of you um, look at the more than 13,000 square miles of the Hudson watershed? Is there a form of, of environmental harm that would be a good test case for pressuring and elevating the rights of the Hudson and its tributaries? Thomas, I'd love for you to take the lead again on that one and I'll join. Yeah, the simple fact from our vantage point is that we've worked more with the St. Lawrence than with the Hudson. Uh, so I would, you know, pass the bar to folks that know more about the Hudson. But uh, in places where river issues have popped up, they've been everything from interference with flow, like challenging dams, uh, to uh, pollution uh, issues that can't be remedied through existing regulatory frameworks. So imposing a different kind of thing. The rights of nature has been around for a while. There's been no Hudson Hudson River communities that have actually adopted a rights of nature law. So we have yet to see the first rights of nature law passed by any community bordering the Hudson. And so I think that makes that first one even more important, which is to pick the right battle. And usually when we go into these kinds of, of things, we uh, find that confrontation that will allow it to roll out to other communities nearby to establish a sense of solidarity. And we've worked with the Bioneers uh, conference folks to put a, some software app, a software app together, which actually allows uh, different communities to join together to pass rights of nature laws in coordination with each other to basically scale up the rights of nature stuff. I think the Hudson River corridor probably lends itself more to that than, than other places. Thomas, Thomas, how could you say that? You helped us with our rights of nature resolution and we're on the Hudson River. You know, our Rampo Mountains go all the way to the Hudson River. Yeah, I used the word municipality very precisely there. 
Okay, I, I forgot. That's right. You're a lawyer. <laughs> right. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, Tom has uh, really helped us out with our rights of nature resolution and you know looking at other nations as as uh, as as models and. Uh, as far as the test case, I mean, it, I think, uh, you know, the uh, nuclear power, Holtec, they wanted to dump, you know, vast amounts of radioactive water into the Hudson River. And, you know, it kind of helped spark us to, you know, uh, make this resolution. So really, we have a test case on that right now. And now they want to have this project maple where they want to have a uh, frack gas pipeline going all the way through the northeast that would cross the hudson river and you know it's it really comes down to how do we deal with our waste and i, I know there was a, a man named uh, al gore who had an interesting take on the golden rule he said do not do unto others downstream which you would not have done to you upstream you know so and then sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it might as well bring it out in the open or air the dirty laundry. I mean, it seems now that we're so concerned about climate change that some environmental people, in my opinion, have lost their minds and want to go nuclear. And to me, that's almost like a debate as to what's worse. Is, is uh, heroin addiction worse or is crystal meth addiction worse? I mean, maybe we should just quit both of these addictions. And if I may, Katie, I just wanted to add in answer to the original question that um, that I think in terms of the nature of the harm, one one thing to think about is the number of 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 uh, plant power plants and um, places that are 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 actually you know profitable industries that take and take and take from the river without reciprocity, without giving back, and. Um, you know, taking in water to to manufacture things and discharging and and just always cutting corners uh, to make sure that 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 I mean to because of business plans, and I think that um, that just thinking about this notion of reciprocity uh, is is important. That if there if there can be a way in which we shift the way people see the river, it's not an open sewer. It's not a receptacle for everybody's waste. It's not. It's a. It's a. It's a living being with agency and right to thrive to thrive and 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 flourish. Um, my helps uh, in terms of those cases whereby because the river hasn't other than than riverkeeper and 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 the indigenous peoples and those who speak for it doesn't have that voice um to but needs that we it is needed to have money to upgrade the sewage systems to um take down some of the dams to uh, continue to clean up the pollution so um I guess in answer to the question about is there a form of environmental harm, I think that it's some of these really basic things that are done all the time and maybe done, you know, more again and again um, that could be shifted uh, so that reciprocity is there so that, you know, the river is seen on its own terms with more respect uh, because it has legal standing. So that's, I don't know if that's a helpful thought, but I wanted to put that out there. But I would also add what's been missing is the will, the the will to do something different. So we were involved with the Ulster County, New York resolution that was introduced uh, on the Hudson River. It was the first kind of serious municipal effort around that particular piece. And uh, we have to understand how radioactive the rights of nature stuff still is. I mean, I was giving talks 20 years ago where we had environmental law professors walking out of the room when we gave a talk about rights of nature, because they're so tightly bound into the environmental regulatory, statutory environmental stuff, it's it's career building for them. And so in Ulster County, what happened was the rights of nature resolution, which was, we helped to write, it was exactly what was needed to give a foundation to then move into the legal, uh, legal realm, that it got stripped out by the environmentalists in Ulster County who replaced all the language because rights language was too powerful too controversial, uh, too confrontational. So what's missing is the will, the will and the understanding that environmental activism has failed. And I, I say that as an environmental lawyer, that environmental law has failed. And we need a new model, one that's not based on this exploitation regulation stuff, but on something different. 
And where that will emerge is there's a way. The rest of it is just drafting and enforcement. Uh, not that any of that's simple, but it takes that will to emerge first. The rest of it is just mechanics. And so that's that's what has to happen around the Hudson at this point. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, so, just so everybody knows, uh, we are a little past seven. So um, you're more than welcome to stay for an extra seven minutes. Uh, we have a few more questions. We may or may not get to all of them. So if we do not answer your question, you could save your question. You could just feel free to maybe send them along and uh, I can um, have either Karana, Thomas, or Owl uh, answer for you uh, later. Um, so next question. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, New York State Green Amendment? And how can we leverage that to support rights of nature, if at all? Thomas? Yeah, I'll, I'll stick my toe in the water. It's not my favorite. Uh, these green amendments are basically, unfortunately, based in this old version of nature is ours to use. We just need to use it responsibly. So it's about rights accruing to people, not to nature. And so it's sometimes hard to get our hands around because we're we're so we're so hungry for anything to be happening that as soon as something comes, we we grab onto it. But I think now more than ever is the time to be really be kind of thoughtful about these other options that are coming out and whether they reflect a true change or not in how we see the world. And there are two things that don't reflect a true change in how we see the world. One is the public trust doctrine material that has come out that says nature is public trust uh, and we, we need to be protected in how we use it. The problem is public trust is all about property, property and, and nature being property. So it doesn't really emerge from that paradigm. And the Green Amendment material doesn't emerge either. It's about rights being held by humans to a healthy environment. So it's our right to use the environment or right to have it healthy. But that doesn't translate into a, a beyond anthropomorphic view of the world. And so as these options come out, I think people just need to have some critical thinking about them, not grab onto the first thing that comes by, because we may accidentally be validating the wrong form. And a lot of that stuff to us is the wrong form. And it's not that we're so didactic. We just ask, how do we get from A to Z and then reverse that, engineer that out? One way we don't get to Z is to think about nature as being just for human exploitation and writing laws that way, it doesn't work and won't get us out of where we are. And so we're kind of always the wet blanket when it comes to public trust or the Green Amendment stuff, because I don't think it gets us there. It is in fact in the wrong mold and it's the wrong language. I would just say, if you remember what I said earlier, I mean, it's not only that we have you know rights to say water or air, I think any good legal system will reflect that. I mean, like the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. I mean, I'm, I'm not prepared to just throw it all out saying it's bad, what have you, or put it in those binary terms. But we do need, as Thomas was, Lindsay was saying, it, it, it's not holistic. We need to recognize that we are water. We are air. It's not that necessarily that we have rights to water. We are water. We are air. And that's why when I was talking about reference man or reference eagle, we need to recognize that what happens in nature is also happening to us. And in that way, I think we can go forward in a good way. So I think I'll probably um, ask this one last. Um, so are there sample law texts? that can be used in localities and states as ways to start the conversation in legislators and others. Um, and kind of related, uh, is there some kind of training in the works to help lay people get rights of nature laws passed in their municipalities? Yes, I'll jump in. The, there's, uh, there is text. We have sample text on our webpage, but I would also say that the city of Potsdam uh, in the northern part of the state, New York, has passed uh, the state's first resolution setting the stage to move to a rights of nature law. It's kind of a good first baby step towards passing a law. 
And so that city of Potsdam language uh, is a good model for other communities, municipalities in New York to pick up and move with, especially if you're at that baby step level of wanting the council to go on record uh, with, uh, with something before they pass a binding law, which is sometimes kind of scary to a municipality to engage in this new kind of lawmaking. And as for training, we do we do free hour long trainings with uh, communities. So communities come to us, they ask us for uh, training to get introduced to the concept. We have that one hour training. We also do a two hour and a six hour, depending on how advanced the community is moving forward to or towards lawmaking, how to talk to your elected officials, what are the key words to use, what are some arguments to use, what's the historical data around rights and nature laws moving forward. So we're happy to, to do any of that for communities that contact us. And uh, I think that's all the time that we have uh, for questions. Um, but just so you know, if you do have any more questions, if your questions did not get answered, just feel free to send them to me. And uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, just send them along to either Corinna, Thomas, or Owl, um, or all three, <laughs> because they seem to give uh, all different perspectives, um, some perspectives. And uh, yeah, and uh, just one more thing. If you want to be, become more involved with Riverkeeper, um, you can go to riverkeeper.org to learn more. Um, and if you want to become a volunteer or donate, uh, you can certainly find those links on our website. Again, that's riverkeeper.org. And uh, Corinna, Thomas, or Owl, do you have any last thoughts? I just want to say how much I enjoyed and learned from um, the presentations that Al and Thomas gave and how grateful I am to you, Katie, and to Sean, and to everyone at Riverkeeper for putting this together. And just that I really think that talking about these things and, um, you know, to the extent people have fears or concerns or questions or whatever about rights of nature, um, to just start having the conversations in communities and organizations that we get all all out on the table is really exciting because there is a, a so much good to come um, of 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 us coming together in these ways, um, and so thank you uh, very much and hope to be talking to all of you more soon. All right, and thank you to all three of you. Uh, thank you again for a wonderful presentation, um, very powerful uh, messaging. Definitely. And uh, hopefully that there's more movement um, in the movement for rights of nature happening. So, you know, let's see to that. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you all again. Thank you so much. Take care.